We continue with a panel discussion on advanced technologies shaping the future of personalized medicine. And we have Elizabeth Breyer, assistant editor at Forbes. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, um, and hello. All right, good morning or afternoon or even evening, depending on where you are in the world, um, our panelists are global. So I know we have a global audience as well, which is amazing. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Breyer. I'm an assistant editor at Forbes magazine in the US. Um, I'm also the founder of Mentally Wear, which is a new digital mental health media platform. Um, I'm so excited to be joined by four amazing panelists to discuss technology shaping the future of personalized medicine and healthcare which obviously in the wake of COVID um, is really something critical to talk about. Um, before we dive into it and before we introduce our panelists, I just wanna let our audience know that you can share your thoughts and questions with us um, regarding this panel on social media using hashtag Webit. And you can also have the opportunity to network via the TVS platform during the days of Webit Global Impact Week. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce or give our, our panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves, um, say who they are and a little bit about them before we kick off into the discussion. So uh, Maki, I'd love to start with you about and uh, tell us where you're based and then just a little bit about your background. Hi everybody, my, my name is Maki Sugimoto from Tokyo, Japan. I'm a surgeon, especially for HPV, hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery. <laughs> and I, also, I'm a founder of Holo Eyes company in, uh, based on Tokyo, Japan. And uh, XR, extended reality application uh, company yeah, for uh, surgical navigation or education and uh, uh, navigation. Radhika, how about you? Hi, I'm Radhika Iyengar. I'm um, founding partner at Star Chain Ventures, or we're a venture studio in uh, Silicon Valley in California uh, in the US. And um, I am also CEO of Barley Corporation, which is a company that is redefining uh, cybersecurity for healthcare and uh, using Web3.0 technologies. Um, I'm an advanced technology expert, uh, author of Enterprise Blockchain Has Arrived, and I'm very focused on the applications and implications of Web 3.0 and advanced technologies in healthcare, um, as well as other sectors, but uh, very passionate about healthcare myself and really looking forward to this discussion on um, what does personalized medicine and personalized healthcare mean for the future. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for being here. And um, how about you, Stefano? Well, thanks. Um, I'm honored to be on this panel, by the way, as you said to us earlier, amazing group of people. Um, I am an orthopedic surgeon. I think actually like Maki, I do hip and knee replacement surgery. I'm a professor at University of California, San Francisco, specializing in hip and knee replacement, as you mentioned. But for many years, I've been dabbling in digital health and technology. I run a conference called the Digital Orthopedics Conference San Francisco and Digital Health 101 as a podcast is actually doing quite well. We're excited about that. And um, I've been uh, very excited about implementing technology. I work at UCSF, implementing a lot of technologies in the digital health space. I'm CTO of our department and work with Center of Digital Health Innovation. So that's, that's plenty out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, busy guy. Um, awesome. And Raphael? Hi, good uh, day. My name is Raphael Grossman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I am a surgeon. I'm a general and uh, a trauma surgeon. And uh, I'm originally from Venezuela, trained in the U.S. and uh, have lived in the U.S. for many years. That's my full-time job. But I've uh, got this parallel time job where I uh, try to get into digital health as much as I can. And uh, my, my uh, passion is really uh, transforming uh, technology uh, uh, that we use every day into technologies that can have an exponential impact. It's about the smart uh, use of technology to make healthcare and healthcare education uh, what uh, they should be in the 21st century. Um, a few years ago, I was the first surgeon who ever used a Google Glass in the operating room. And that got me a little bit uh, a push out there in the, in the, in the social media uh, 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 ecosystem, I guess. And I'm pretty active in Twitter and LinkedIn and try to really be a resource uh, as much as possible for anyone trying to 
uh, get into the digital health space and improving what we do and improving global access uh, to healthcare, which is a, a you know paramount importance. So it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, thank you all so much. Truly, this is, I said it earlier before we started, but this is an incredible panel. Um, and so let's just dive in. I wanna start from sort of a high level and I wanna hear from all of you, your thoughts on what you think are some of the most, um, you know, important digital healthcare, pharma and orthopedic trends shaping the future of medicine. Sort of broadly, how will technology impact the way we deliver care, um, you know, sort of in the immediate future, what's being worked on now. And uh, Radhika, I'd love to get your thoughts on this first. Great, um, happy to share my thoughts. Uh, well, I'm uh, actually very passionate about the data perspective and the data conversation in healthcare. Um, I'm a very firm ag advocate of looking at the foundational uh, challenges we have with data in healthcare um, in order to be able to do all of the many things that we'd like to see realized in healthcare. So when we're talking about personalized medicine or personalized healthcare, uh, a lot of digital tools that are available to us uh, at our fingertips, so to speak, and so many great advances being made on many fronts. However, the underlying conversation around data is one that I find needs a lot more attention and a lot more um, uh, scrutiny, if you will. And so for me, the conversation around healthcare really fundamentally revolves around what we're doing with data, how we take in data, what we do with the data, how we process it, and the output that comes out of it. And so for me, the entire conversation about health and what we see in the future of health um, really has data as, as its underpinning. So I'm very passionate about solving some of the biggest issues and challenges we have around data. Um, if you look at the delivery of care, um, you can't deliver proper care if you don't have all about your patient. So, uh, and doctors continue to suffer from the uh, task of uh, going through and reading through massive PDFs, for example, not really understanding the context around their patient and when they really should be focused on the delivery of care itself. So for me, technology is a great tool for at our, available to us. And uh, technologies such as blockchain and AI, for example, often in combination, really change the nature of the conversation around data in healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. And so securing and, and, and making sure that the privacy around data remains intact and sacred, if you will, um, ensuring that the right patient IDs are attached to the data so that we don't have errors uh, when we're practicing um, healthcare in, in the field. That's something that really excites me and I'm looking forward to being a part of the journey of redefining what it means to have the entire arc of data in that health continuum. Uh, so these are things that I'm very actively involved in, not only in our venture studio, but also um, as CEO of Barley Corporation, as I mentioned, which is redefining cybersecurity for healthcare. Um, this, since we suffer so, from so many attacks these days and these attacks are getting not only more insidious, but uh, you know, grave to the point where we're unable to provide access to healthcare when we're uh, unable to provide services because uh, hospitals or hospital providers are held ransom in many instances. Um, and there are uh, other breaches uh, that are of, of great egregious natures uh, that are occurring. So these are something that things that I'm very passionate about solving is foundational challenges around data. Yeah, that's super interesting. And um, I wanna bring in uh, Raphael into that conversation too. Uh, what are your thoughts on what Radhika said and just kind of, again, a high level look at what technology is doing for personalized healthcare and where it should be going. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think those uh, thoughts are, are right on the, on, on the money, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, down deep, it's all about the data, right? And how we produce the data, how we validate the data, how we protect the data. Um, my 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 personal perspective in in, in regards to, to to what technologies out there uh, would uh, very quickly I think have an impact uh, are basically two. 
uh, I think that uh, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning, natural language processing, that uh, ecosystem is uh, becoming a, a, of, of, of more than ever paramount importance and more and more a day-to-day -day thing and uh, something that we can actually see rather than something in the very deep background where we have had AI in the past and we really didn't, didn't notice the, the impact that it was having in, uh, in, in healthcare, in, in the provision of healthcare. And I think that AI is becoming much more prominent in that role of AI. And uh, maybe because of my other uh, thought is on uh, immersive realities and XR, right? What we call medical extended reality. I think that uh, uh, the way we connect, the way we communicate, not just amongst ourselves, but uh, with data, uh, with digital data, it's uh, it's becoming really uh, something so so simple and so uh, common these days. And uh, we have multiple examples, you know, uh, things that, that that Stefano is aware of, uh, uh, what uh, Maki is uh, doing with Hollow Eyes and, and many other companies, from education to uh, diagnostics and 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 interpretation and connection with the, the digital radiologic imaging data of the patient, for example, before and after after the, 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 the healthcare uh, interaction or the surgical operation, for example, but also in the digital realm, uh, digital therapeutics realm. I think that immersive reality paired with a, a artificial intelligent uh, a, a algorithms is going to have a, a tremendous impact within the next three to five years and is gonna, in a way, it radically change uh, the way we, we teach medicine, the way we learn medicine, the way we access a, a care. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. Um, Mackie, what do you, I see you nodding your head. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm very focused on the, uh, I'm int very interested, interested in the AI and machine learning and deep learning, as Rafael said. And uh, the uh, extended reality and the immersive reality is now going to be uh, uh, the metaverse. The, uh, the CEO of a uh, Facebook company uh, said, the, the the term metaverse is very important in the near future. So I think that we should get the medical data, not only the non the verbal communication, but also the non-verbal or non-literature communication, and uh, such as the movement of the arms of the surgeons and the thought of what what the doctors thought in the clinical uh, setting or the uh, treatment. So we should get more data, not only the literature, but also the movement and the, the time differences. So uh, the avatar is the, another uh, topics and the point for the data convergence. So the metaverse is the term, you know, refers to the convergence of physical augmented and virtual reality in the shaped online space. And we get the movement data of the movement of the surgeon using the avatar and the metaverse. Mm -hmm. So uh, our company now we uh, reproduce the medical imaging data to the 3D and not also the virtual reality, but also the augmented reality and the mixed reality, like a hologram in the air. In the metaverse world, we can share these data in the in the air using the, each arbiters of the, not only the doctors and the patient and the healthy people. And we can gather the, uh, the movement of their own and then we can uh, turn their data to the AI or machine learning or deep learning. We can uh, evaluate these movement is right or wrong for the each patient, individual patient that the, you know, the precision medicine, I think, and in the, new in the new future, not only the patient, but also the healthy people can gather in the metaverse world, uh, and not only in the hospital, but also the, uh, the social uh, settings. Yeah, no, that's a super interesting point. And uh, I knew we were gonna touch on metaverse at some point, so I'm glad we ripped the Band-Aid off. Um, <laughs> Stefano, what do you what do you think? Yeah, look, fantastic stuff. And I, I totally agree with the concept. I used with Radhika and everybody. So here's the story though. In healthcare, we actually suffer from data penia. We don't have enough data to answer the kinds of questions we're expecting to answer. And that data is not currently accessible to us in ways we can actually use. Now, AI and NLP will help with that as it'll start to tag the data and actually make it searchable. But it is a huge problem we have today. 
Now, the other thing is that we don't know a lot about the data we're looking for. So for example, in my, in my research lab, the work I'm working on right now is trying to figure out how to do predictive analytics to understand how patients will fare after surgery. Now, here's the thing, once I got into it and I started doing some work, I realized that we can talk about AI and machine learning, NLP and all that stuff, but I don't know what data to collect from these sensors. What's the frequency? What's the Hertz rate? How long do you have to collect it for? Does the patient wear it every day? Is it once a week successful? How long does that data need to be collected for? So I had to turn to Google and have a big grant from Google. We're working together with the smartest people on the planet to try to figure out how to use these sensors in a way that actually gives us data we can use as opposed to simply descriptive data, which is where we are today in healthcare. We can sort of describe a problem, but we're not there yet when it comes to understanding what that data means and then how to implement it. And when we do implement it, what impact to expect. That said, it's all coming. I think that we're, we're all setting the stage in really well, um, in really thoughtful ways, in such a way that we can start to bring a UI to the AI, because that's the other problem that we have. We now have this data, we're starting to make sense of it, but it's not in places where we can access it. So it's gotta be really important for companies like Radica's that are investing in really next generation interfaces is how to bring that information to physicians and, and patients in a way that's gonna become um, more integrated. And when I mentioned patients, it's the last point I'll make is that what you're gonna see in the future is a, is a potentiation of the patient. We get to personalized care. It won't be just the physicians providing personalized care. You'll see a massive in, in, uh, change in the way that um, the patient will, have, uh, will be part of the team. Years ago at one of the Daniel Crafts conferences in La Jolla, they asked me to talk about the future of healthcare. And the way I talked about it is like, I think we, we surgeons, the three of us, will go away, we'll move away from being sort of godlike presences with control over everything to more like a coach that'll help our patients make decisions and track their own lives. I wonder what Raphael thinks about that as well, because it is where it's a very different dynamic that's going to happen when the data becomes a shared and reliable, to Radica's point, because the data is going to be secured in blockchain, a live asset. So it's an interesting place. We can see where we're going with the future. It's an exciting place to be. But right now, there's a lot of us trying to figure out the basic nuts and bolts of this data, how to use it, how to access it, how to collect it. Yeah, that's a great point. That actually brings me right to the next question I wanted to ask, which is looking at surgical care specifically, um, you know, and I, I did want to ask Raphael this, uh, how have you been using technology to improve your surgical outcomes and you know, with data in particular and technology, how can this provide better access to surgical care, like specifically? Well, I, uh, like I said, I'm a full-time surgeon in the, in the U.S., in the Northeast U.S., and uh, uh, sometimes uh, a lot of the things that I dream about and talk about and to help others build uh, are not readily available for me to use on my patients. I certainly have changed the way that I educate my students, my, you know, the residents, uh, the patients uh, using technologies uh, like uh, XR, you know, the, mostly virtual reality, but also augmented or, or, or mixed reality, uh, teaching uh, students, patients, uh, 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 you know, how to, how, to, how to connect with all that information that before was uh, either verbal or uh, in paper or in, or in text form or, or, or whatnot. Uh, I think that that's uh, probably the, the most radical uh, change that I've had in the last, uh, probably the last 10 years, I would say, using devices, uh, you know, mobile devices that now are not just supercomputers, but they're uh, supercomputers with, with augmented reality capabilities. If you look at any smartphone today has an AR core or AR a kit the capabilities and you can project a, a living organ or heart or the anatomy that you're going to attack on that particular patient. And you can finally have those patients really understand, you know, what you're talking about when you draw a diagram or when you tell them what, what you're going to do. And uh, so uh, uh, now, uh, aside from that and, and beyond that, uh, I think that uh, uh, especially the field of education uh, also uh, with virtual reality and haptics and how uh, you can now a, 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 a factually a train a, the surgeon in a much different way that you or we used to train in the past a, a, and still 
training today in, in most places and most places in the world. Remember that you know we talk about a, a very uh, very uh, a, the tip of the iceberg sort of uh, a, a, a glass ball of of uh, of uh, blessed <laughs> access to everything that that the world has today. But most of the world doesn't have access to that. But if we look at uh, a virtual reality, for example, and uh, a connecting virtually and remotely and teaching someone either in virtual reality or in, 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 in live in virtual reality, how to do an operation. And uh, if you add haptics and you add the feeling of that virtual world and imagine someone learning how to do a procedure, you know, a, a knee replacement like Stefan does or hepatobiliary surgery like a Mackie does or really any procedure and not just surgeons, but imagine paramedics and emergency personnel, nurses, a technicians doing procedures, learning step, by step procedural uh, things <clears throat> now in, in virtual reality with the ability to feel this uh this uh, a, 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 this digital world, I think that that is uh, is something that uh, we've been slowly getting to do more and more, and it's really really exciting because then you can have someone in somewhere in Latin America where where they have you know minimal uh, a, a, a access to uh, to telecommunications, but they still can connect with you in a virtual reality headset, or I can have my a, a sort of. A, expertise right brought to them remotely without moving from my desk and bring my hand to the operating room i always think of platforms like proximi ar for example from the uk and uh, they have done a phenomenal work bringing that expertise remotely using technology and you can have someone a, 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 a do a better or more careful or a, a surgery with better outcome just because you are there with them via the technology capability. So uh, those things are, are really uh, exciting and they're not a, a, a sci-fi sci -fi anymore, science fiction anymore. They are real. And that is the actual metaverse, you know, that we are already living in, I think. Right. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to bring it back to Mackie too, to talk about sort of like the metaverse aspect of it specifically. Um, you know, what benefits do you see there or are already being implemented, especially, you know, living in a world that's very global now. And I think especially living in a world very virtual um, due to COVID and whatnot, just kind of what the implications of all this really are. Yeah, now, the, under the COVID-19 situation, we should uh, stay remotely, each patient by patient and a surgeon by, by surgeons. And uh, actually, now nowadays, the metaverse, are, in the metaverse world, we only use the image or movement of the avatar. Oh, that's it. There's no uh, tactile feedback. That's the point. And now we're uh, developing the new uh, surgical robot in Japan. It has the, I'm sorry, the oh. tactile sensation, right? And we have the tactile sensation, 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 and we can share the touching experience to all over the world. So the point is that sense, not only the visual, or uh, uh, sounds, but the tactile feedback. If we can share the tactile sensation by each, each other, and we could know much about the te technology or technique for surgical procedure, of the surgical procedure, that, that this patient organ is soft or hard, or uh, uh, what is the best point to prevent the bleeding during the actual surgery, or is it cancer or not? We can, we we could know we, we can know much about the tactile sensation using this uh, new um, surgical robot. And the metaverse is the point. Another point, the avatar is very informative for communicate communication by themselves. And the uh, the face is another point. The uh, smile or angry or something uh, in the avatar we can share. We can share the uh, the emotion itself, uh, human by human. The communication should need the emotion, right? So the data should be transformed to the emotional one, 
uh, not only the literature, not only the sound, but the uh, emotional something. Uh, I, I, I don't know much about that now, now, but in the near future, we should focus on the emotion or the movement or time differences and for the data. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, Radhika, that made me want to ask you, you know, with um, venture money, where, like, what of these technologies or different, like, aspects are kind of like the most alluring to you when it comes to investment? Wow, that's a voluminous question. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of attention, I think a lot more attention. I mean, healthcare in general, digital health in general, and I'll say, you know, next generation technologies uh, that are really helping us, you know, get a handle on some of the foundational challenges that we have, like I said, around data. That is a, that's a very big uh, area of investment interest, uh, not only for people that I know, but also, you know, just in general, the healthcare community. If there's one thing that came about with the pandemic is this heightened awareness of how important our health is, if that wasn't already obvious to us. Uh, and this is something that is a global conversation. This is not isolated to just me and my little backyard. This is a very much a global community challenge, uh, something that we need to solve together. So for me, you know, from, from either an investment perspective or from um, any other perspective in terms of what's the next frontier, if you will, it's how we help bring communities together. Uh, Rafael, you were talking about somebody in Latin America being able to access care in the right way. Um, you know, how do we do that? And in order to do that, you've got to safeguard the most foundational aspect of healthcare for me, that's data. Um, you know, securing it and preserving privacy controls around data. That's an essential component for me in that conversation around data. We can't do anything meaningful with the data until we secure the data itself and until we have this um, infrastructure around data that is securing and preserving privacy where we need it most. Um, so as I look beyond and I look at the future of digital health, the future of medicine, the future of healthcare, for me, it's very much focused on that data issue. And if we're gonna bring all of these people, quote unquote, online into the digital sphere, whether in the metaverse or through extended reality or any other, you've got to preserve the interactions with the right safeguards around that interaction. So for me, that's a big passion is, um, you know, what I'm seeing very actively out there. Um, you look at healthcare even, one of the biggest areas that is just a tremendous area of interest is cybersecurity. Um, mm -hmm. We can't do anything until we really secure and safeguard what we need to safeguard most uh, importantly, which is our data. Uh, so I think that's kind of, for me, a big, uh, big conversation point. Yeah, no, and that was something I was going to bring up later, but since we're talking about it, yeah, I mean, cybersecurity has obviously been like a huge hot topic across so many industries, but um, healthcare, it's particularly pertinent given privacy issues, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I do want to loop Raphael back in about that. Uh, where do you think we stand in terms of cybersecurity being where we need it to be for technology, um, you know, to get it to where it's going? Um, are the levels sort of matching and to what extent does it need to be sort of further developed? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, right, on, on cybersecurity, but uh, I think that any a physician, a practicing physician, probably anywhere in, in, in the world uh, it, it, it has a lot of uh, a, 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 some, some of, a, of a very close, a, a, a deep feeling about uh, security, right? Because I mean, in the US is HIPAA and the, a, 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 in Asia, a, in Europe is different systems, but the, the, we're always been sort of uh, a trained, uh, a, a ingrained on us the uh, fact that we need to make sure that, that the uh, patient data, right? The, the, the health uh, data uh, stays private. And that has always been, you know, for the last at least couple of decades, right? A, a very a high focus on that. Uh, now, uh, that's obviously you know different that, than sort of the, the, the biggest the cyber security conversation but uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's uh, it's such a major uh, uh, issue you see how every day 
we we almost we learn about uh, you know X or Y system uh, being hacked in the U.S. and I'm pretty sure and 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 Radica would know better you know all over the world and millions and millions of of, of dollars and and uh, other currencies are being asked for ransom uh, uh, and a lot of that happens in healthcare because it's a very uh, 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 I guess a juicy a very uh, you know is is golden data I guess right uh, but uh, uh, I think that we're probably pretty raw and pretty in the start of that slope in regards to how do we develop systems that really, really protect that data and protect health systems. And, and uh, I, I would go back to what uh, Radhika said, that, that it's all about the data and protecting that data. We need to start there. And uh, we produce all this data in a, in a sort of a, 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 a random and, and, and crazy way, uh, you know, we're gonna have a bigger problem. So I think that uh, going back to your question about investment, I think that that would be a very important area to develop, hence a very important area to invest on in order to get the systems out there that really can protect that information before the information even exists. So right. uh, yeah, that'd be my thought. Yeah, and Radhika, kicking it back to you, do you think we are far off from where cybersecurity needs to be, or are we sort of getting it to where it needs to be now? Um, what's kind of like the timeline in your mind of where we are and where we need to go? Um, I'll say that the current state is pretty dismal. Um, all of the most sophisticated um, hospitals, health systems, uh, you name it, have uh, some really di difficult challenges. Um, Luckily, help is on the way. Um, this is where I'm part of the solution because when I see a problem as pervasive uh, globally around this uh, issue, um, I need to be a part of that solution. Um, so, uh, you know, the company that I'm building, Barley Corporation, is using Web3.0 technologies, blockchain, and AI to uh, provide a zero trust environment for data. And so, you know, what I'd like to see the, in the future is where we don't have to worry about it. Um, I think, you know, what Raphael, what you said about healthcare data being so valuable, um, so juicy, as you said, um, it's a tremendous incentive for people to try to get at it and several hundred dollars per record uh, as the going rate. And if you get more complex data, uh, the price goes up. So I think that, you know, for us, when it comes to safeguarding privacy, safeguarding security by design, not as an afterthought, um, that's where I'm part of that solution in terms of building that next generation platform that secures trust around data in healthcare um, or beyond, right? And so this is not something that is an afterthought anymore. This has to be a core part of the infrastructure. And so that's what I'm very excited about solving. Um, I don't want to have to wake up to another news that we've got, you know, a million plus records out there on the dark web or what have you, um, is as we're getting into this increasingly connected environment in healthcare, um, we've got patient generated data with trackers, remote monitors, uh, all of those things that are coming into play, telemedicine that has become such a centerpiece of the delivery of care during the pandemic and now beyond, we really have to secure that entire data infrastructure that meshes all of that together. And so to me, that's really a, a foundational problem that is, is worth solving. Uh, because you know, as we're bringing more and more people online into this infrastructure, edge security, internal security, external security, all of this is absolutely something that we've got to look at a end-to-end -end security model, not a point solution kind of situation, which is what we have today. Um, so I think that, you know, the help is on the way. Uh, that's the company that I'm building and I'm looking at redefining what it means to have end-to-end -end data security so that we can then go about providing the level of care um, and go about achieving the goals that we've set forth in terms of providing a much more personalized healthcare or personalized medicine to patients around the world. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Um, Stefano, from your, your own work, what are your sort of thoughts on that and you know, your concerns on cybersecurity and just the direction that we're headed with um, having the right technology to address it? Absolutely, I think it's been said already Healthcare is the least protected of all the in sub industries in the U.S. healthcare system, 
is also the place where there's the least amount of um, disposable cash to invest in investment solutions. That's the other problem is, and what's happening is the impact it's had is a massive chilling effect on the adoption of new technology. Because every CTO of every healthcare system's number one concern is not having a data breach. So if you bring to them a solution that involves an API and an API impacts their, their electronic health record, they basically say no. They don't even ask what the question is, what the problem you're trying to solve. They say no. It's been absolutely amazing. I mean, you've got some, especially the CTOs are a little less con, um, aggressive in terms of their way of thinking about it. So it's an interesting problem in terms of not so much just what we've been talking about is the impact it may have on patient care and the need to be able to have this access, et cetera. And, and, and I think the blockchain may be a solution. Um, there's also the question of security relative to quantum uh, quantum computing. When there's no, when you simply can't create a password that's 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 big enough and strong enough because the quantum computer can access it, that whole idea of securing data by having a password protected data set kind of goes out the window. So you're going to have to rethink how we collect the data, and that's where the blockchain really comes in. So we're going to see a massive shift in data collection. But again, I want to come back to this idea that we have. If the data may be juicy, but it's not as it's not as good as you think it is. The only reason it's juicy is because people care. We're going to move into a situation where your healthcare data no longer is a secret. It's 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 an it's a it's a historical asset that we have when people because it's worried about discrimination about the use of that data. That's really the use case problem, right? So we're thinking about how how we're going to change our relationship to our data, particularly our healthcare data. Who's going to own that data? Will it be accessible through a through the web, or are you going to carry it with you as your own personal data kit? So there's a there's going to be a significant shift in how we approach the data issue, as well as the data collection process, and then the issue, and then a, um, a thing I think a social qualitative issue about how we approach our data. I think you'll find that with time we'll become a lot more relaxed about it because once you have genomics out there and we understand how to use the genomics, we'll be more of an open book. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. Um, and a few of you now have mentioned uh, blockchain specifically. Um, and I kind of want to dive into that and sort of elaborate on the current role of blockchain in healthcare, as well as its future implementations. Um, and I'd love to, you know, while I have you actually start with you, Stefano, kind of elaborating on the again, like the use of blockchain in a healthcare setting, like what does that actually mean? Right, so the blockchain is a secure ledger, right? It's simply, think of it as a very fancy Excel spreadsheet that you can't change. That's the simplest possible way. Radical may have a better solution, but just so somebody doesn't understand it well, it's a data set that's, that's immutable and changeable. The problem is you don't want everything in the blockchain. You just need the, the key data points. The blockchain is not an inexpensive thing to set up, energy-wise, et cetera. I think a lot of people tend to forget that it's not the easiest thing to do. But Radica and some other companies are trying to solve that problem. Nonetheless, the blockchain creates us an immutable data chain. Now, once you can access who accesses that data, a lot of interesting things can happen because you can start to, to, you can start to use data as an asset, not just as a reference point, but as an asset to incentivize people to contribute to that asset as a way to actually have generate income. It's an interesting concept we've been thinking about in terms of how to collect data from patients longitudinally when they stop having an interest in providing that data, because that's another issue with us, right? Because we, we want to go from occasional data provision to continuous data collection. The problem is once you start getting to continuous data collection, the, number, the amount of data that we're asking for is so massive, you simply can't put all of that in the blockchain. So we have to figure out where the blockchain has its most value and then apply it to those data sets. Now, that may be my understanding of the blockchain as it is as stands today. It may be that it's moving forward into a whole new world and universe that will be more accessible. And I think Radhika is like, not if she yeah. wants to jump in on that. I just wanted to jump in just to set the record straight because I think there's um, some misconceptions around blockchain. So first of all, you know, I'll just address the uh, the uh, energy consumption and so on. That's really for proof of work systems and the permissionless, permission networks, uh, permissionless networks like Bitcoin, for example et cetera. When you're moving into permissioned environments, which is where I work in enterprise, um, energy is not, a, not at all a consideration because it's not, it's the way you compute. It's not a compute intensive kind of activity. We, we're going to get into the deep weeds if I continue along that course. I just wanted to mention that 
The other thing is that, you know, if you're looking at uh, what exactly the blockchain is, it's beyond just a database. This is about multi-ownership of uh, data. Uh, so right now we've got single owners of data. We've got central repositories of data. And so these centralized systems just have a, a construct where it's one owner of a data set. Um, people can have copies, but that copy is not owned by you. In blockchain, it's a very different construct, which is that there are multiple owners of that data. You all see the copies of that data, but you also own those data. So, you know, it's a very different mentality, and different approach to the conversation around data. So I just wanted to, you know, jump into what Stefano was saying so that the audience understands that there's a very different way of looking at how we share data. And then to be clear, blockchain is really not meant for the actual data itself. These are records of the transactions on data. And that's a very different thing we're talking about. Uh, storage is a very different conversation and there's decentralized storage mechanisms, which are much more powerful than centralized storage mechanisms. Again, because you've got this splitting into data into multiple owners of data, if you will. So when hackers trying to get in, for example, they can't because the data is not all in one place. Uh, unfortunately, with the systems we have today, all of the data is basically in one central repository. So if you can hack your way into that system, you basically have keys to the kingdom. So I think, you know, I just wanted to put some broad brush strokes around what Stefano was talking about, because um, some of the understanding around what the blockchain is, how it provides value to systems in healthcare, for example. And so when I was talking about the zero trust sort of environment, um, as well as being able to log every single thing that happens in terms of a transaction record, uh, that's really very powerful because now you're seeing anybody that's trying to interact with the data at any given time and being able to see what happens. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think um, we all definitely, you know, I think blockchain for a lot of us is sort of a confusing topic. So it's great to have the broad brushstrokes, as you said. Um, I want to sort of switch gears a little bit. I know we've talked about a lot of like the AI and sort of the more ethereal looks at um, the technology that exists, but I want to go kind of deeper into like the physical application specifically robotics and how that's defining our surgical future. Um, so I wanna actually talk to you, Maki, about that, how robotics are playing a role right now in the future of personalized medicine and what are some of the technologies you hope um, that that field will expand into? Yeah, robotics for medicine is very good, but very uh, informative, and, uh, but now, uh, the automatic surgery is not uh, uh, realized in the, uh, today, but we are now uh, focusing on the uh, movement of the arms of the patient, uh, of the surgeon, or the tactile feedback of the organs and uh, 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 cancer lesions or something. But, you know, the, uh, I'm very focused on the problem about the responsibility. Then the 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 to whom does medical practice data belong? That mm -hmm. that very important point. And we surgeon can perform the surgery, but the movement of the our uh, medical devices, uh, the, the data of the mo movement of the medical device is uh, of to whom that does these these data belongs. And we can uh, calculate and uh, we can analyze the movement, it's good or bad, but who belongs it the data. And uh, yeah. we need the, the usage rules uh, for standardization, for uh, regulation to use the, med uh, the surgical robots. And in Japan, we are now developing the new uh, robotic system for uh, accessing the movement data to gather all over the all over Japan, but in US it's very difficult to get the to collect the data of the movement of the arms uh, outside the US, right? So in the near future we should have a regulation to use the regular uh, loop for uh, collecting the the uh, procedure data over surgeon. 
Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. And I, I want to kick it over to um, Raphael. What are your thoughts on this and robotics specifically in the personalized medicine uh, field? I think robotics, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very exciting field. It's not really robotic surgery. It's robotic assisted surgery. It's always a human who's driving the robot. And uh, we've been in a, almost in a, in a standstill, you know, for, for a few decades up until very recently when multiple companies have uh, a, 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 came out uh, with a, a more modular, a less a expensive, a more versatile and flexible solutions, you know, CMR, Medtronics, et cetera, et cetera. I think the next three or so years are gonna be really exciting in the a, a, a availability of a different robotic systems for specific operations. I see robotics, as a field that that is, a, 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 you know, the, the, certainly the future of surgery, the way it should be, not the way that it has been in the last two or three decades. If you add, you know, AI, machine learning, image recognition, and uh, tactile feedback, you know, haptic feedback to those robotic uh, systems, then now we are really, really talking a, a, a real a, a paradigm a change, right? But also we got to think that, you know, robotic surgery to do a specific operation better, right, is one thing. But then we need to think how robotic surgery can then uh, bring that potential of getting that excellent surgery to someone who does not have access to that system. And uh, initially when robotics was uh, thought of, you know, back to 25, uh, 30 years ago, you know, the, the, the U.S. military is trying to develop robots where a surgeon, you know, saving you know, a hospital in, 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 in a city could do remote a, a tele-surgery, right? Somewhere else in the world where, where his expertise or her expertise was needed. So we need to go back to that in a sense. And, and we are slowly getting there with, with AR and companies like that said, Proximi AR, but we need to find a way, and, and we will, where the robotic system is so portable, so uh, inexpensive, so easy, that it, and, and so a, a, a potent in a way that will allow that expert surgeon to do remote surgery in a place out there, you know, where the surgery is needed, because we need to improve the outcome locally, but we need to also improve access to global health, to global surgery. That, that is a paramount important, importance that we cannot forget about that. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point and brings me directly to what I wanted to ask next, since, you know, obviously healthcare is a global issue. It's not a U.S. specific issue. Um, so what the ad adoption of new technology and medicine around the world, what are the big differences and what do we need to unite on um, to have an impact on the effect of healthcare? What technologies do we need to see, as you were just saying, um, to sort of bring these modern technologies and practices to the entire world and not just certain countries that are maybe developing them. Um, and I wanna go to you first, Radhika, to hear your thoughts since you're investing in these companies um, and kind of get your thoughts on what we need to make this have a global impact. So again, really great question. Um, when I think about the, lo the global landscape, it's a pretty varied landscape. So if you're talking about Providing medical care in, uh, say, the U U.S. or maybe in Europe, for example, it's one scenario. And then when you look at emerging markets, it's a very different scenario. Uh, what I'd like to look at, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at already trends, for example, in, in finance. We've got traditional finance that is bridging over into DeFi now, it's decentralized finance. And then what I call is um, kind of a term that, I, that I've coined, which is MoFi, which is mobile finance. So you've got a lot of accessibility through the mobile devices now, not necessarily through smartphones everywhere, although that penetration is increasing as the cost of devices is, made, is being brought down and made it, being made more accessible in emerging markets. But when you look at the future of healthcare, you really have to kind of mentally look at what is the lowest common denominator across the globe. And it's really low in terms of accessibility. I was just on a panel um, a couple of days ago uh, when we're talking about closing the health disparity gaps around the world. So when you think about access to healthcare, what does that really mean? The average person in a underdeveloped or emerging market situation 
doesn't have the kind of access to devices that you and I take for granted. They don't have a tablet. They, don't, they might not even have a, st- a smartphone, right? And so they probably have something like a feature phone. How do you deliver next generation healthcare through a feature phone? What is the method of triaging that? How do we provide access to care so that it's a fundamental right, a human right, rather than this select few in the world that have access to the best of healthcare? So I think that when we're ta- whether we're talking, you know, robotic assisted surgery or uh, robotic assisted healthcare, or whether you're talking about uh, telemedicine or any of those advancements that we've seen that have that have been so amazing and have brought the world a little closer as we solve these global health crises. We've got to think about the lowest common denominator. So if you've got a community that doesn't necessarily have access to internet, that doesn't have access to power, uh, that doesn't have access to the type of connectivity that we see today in the developed world, that's something that is of great concern. So how do you develop next generation healthcare and systems that deliver the best of care to everyone globally. This is something that I'm looking at. So, you know, when I'm thinking about impactful solutions, I'm absolutely thinking about how do you deliver that care to everyone, not just uh, the few of us in the world that have access to the best of technology. Yeah, that's a really great way of saying it. Um, Stefano, what are your thoughts on this, making it, you know, a global solvable issue? you know, like with the lowest common denominator, as Radhika said. Access, you mean access through technology? I think Radhika made a good point about the infrastructure not being there yet to be, you know, that the, it's it's set up actually to create a digital divide between the haves and the haves and so how do you How do you breach that? How do you cr- cross that? One of the things we saw early on in, in maybe Digital Health 101, uh, the beginning of digital health implementation was that in in countries with less developed um, environments, text-based messaging wound up being a very useful and effective way to get message across. And it was, we don't necessarily have to start with assuming that you need to have one-to-one video conferencing to deliver great care, where there's where the infrastructure where, where the infrastructure doesn't support it. So we sh- so that's an important thing. And also to go back to sort of your underlying question is how do you actually get this technology developed? I think one of the things I'm seeing on the ground all the time is the question of ROI. I mean, I without pushing back, I'm seeing where I'm seeing we, we didn't get to it earlier, but where I'm seeing the biggest impact of these technologies right now is not in the fancy, sexy stuff of of you know delivering virtual surgery across the planet. It's things like resource reallocation in the hospital, optimizing using an operating room. How do you how do you not how do you avoid uh, giving somebody the wrong medication? Those may not be as exciting, but that's where the ROI is. That's where the actual benefit of the technology we can deliver in the, today in the next five years is going to be. It's not necessarily in the super, and we, it's fun to talk about the really exciting stuff. At the end of the day, if, if you go into a healthcare system with 2% margins and they need to figure out a way of deploying a, a technology that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, or if not millions, they got to be able to find a way to recuperate those investments And it can't just be in better quality unless that better quality increases their margins some other way. It has to be, it's it's addressing a a problem and it can't just be a regular problem. It has to be a real pain point. One of the biggest pain points in healthcare right now isn't quality of care we deliver, especially in the United States, it's physician burnout. It's the fact we're running out of doctors. We have 11,000 physicians shortage. We're looking at 400,000 medical assistance shortage that predates COVID. And then we had the massive sick out. Everybody's gone. We can we don't have enough certain nurses to, to staff our operating rooms. These are the real problems today. They're not necessarily data sharing. They're not necessarily telehealth and telemedicine. It's how do we deliver care on a day-to-day basis and infrastructure that's starting to break under the, uh, under the pressures of the demands that are put upon it. And there are digital solutions. They're awesome. We have this issue of security that has to be breached because hospitals are unwilling to, to take on these challenges because they're worried about security. So I think what Radica is doing is right on target. The key to the deployment of these technologies is going to be in solving the security issue and very soon thereafter solving the ROI issue. And the back of that is Everybody's going after the doctors and without getting too political about this, but recently they just dropped physician payments again. So you got this decreasing resource and they're making it harder to get the work done. 
and it isn't helping. And so the entire system is going to have to go through this massive restructuring around which will come better data collection, better data sharing, et cetera. But there's some really important things happening right now that are going to take precedence to some of the very sexy stuff that we've been talking about. But I love what Radhika is doing. I'm so glad she corrected me on blockchain. I have a lot of learning to do as well as always, but, but, but the, the concept though is still there. And it's gonna be one of the key solutions is how do you decentralize the data so it's not hackable? I mean, that's such a great point that she made. Yeah. Well, I'll just, can I just jump in, Stefano, because I just have to. The other thing that we're going to be able to see with uh, decentralized technologies is uh, patient IDs. It's a whole new conversation. Uh, I think we've been talking about patient centric medicine for such a long time. And where are we with that? We really aren't anywhere with that, as far as I'm concerned. So I think that from a data perspective, when you're talking about patient-owned data, um, truly where we're granting somebody access to our data, healthcare data, um, we're going to be able to see a next generation of healthcare that we've only dreamed about. Um, if you think about access to the millions, let's say even in emerging markets or de the developing world, as they're coming online with feature phones and so on, we are gonna to have to have unique patient IDs that are decentralized, not hackable, uh, that now grant the rights kinds of access. You're gonna to have to make sure the doctor has to make sure be, may be able to have that secure, security mentally saying, this is the right patient I'm treating, even if it's many miles away. It's not somebody posing as a patient because that data and that context around who that patient is is going to be incredibly important to provide the right level of care for that person. So um, I'm glad that we're having this conversation around patient data and ownership. What does it mean to have that? How is it going to transform the kind of care delivery we're hoping to see in the future because of that? Yeah, and no, just to follow up on that, Sorry, Elizabeth, so for the audience who may not understand that the idea of a unique, unique individual identifier per individual is something that most people assume is the correct, but the reality is we don't have one. We definitely don't have one in the United States. The Europeans will get there first. And the reason we don't have it in the United States is because of state rights issues, which goes back to the revolution. It's a very fundamental problem we have in the country in terms of there's no way for us, the federal government, to impose across the state the use of a single patient identifier. Um, we may come up, but that's the, that's, that is absolutely right. Because if you don't have one numbers attached to you that's immutable, it's like that, again, potentially that's where the, the blockchain will come and help us out. But it's it, from a legal perspective, from a um, political construct, it's a very difficult problem. Yeah. Um, well, not to leave it on sort of a uh, unclear note, but I do think we are out of time. Um, but I really appreciate you all being here and sharing your insights. I know I learned a lot and I think our audience um, probably has too. And so I want to thank you all for being here. This was great. And um, yeah, future of healthcare. It's going to be exciting. Very exciting. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great to be with you all.